making the world we should learn from the fathers and learning from them is not copying them at the level of your life is good they inspire you you copy something paul said be imitators of me as i'm imitators of christ i'm an imitator of christ the word is mimitos so there's nothing wrong but when you grow you find your dimension you find your dimension there must be a word of god in your spirit that's what makes you a minister and you don't have to be a general overseer i use these ones because all of us know them what is the message you have for your generation because you ought to have one message for your generation and I'm not saying if you're in a congregation or you're serving the congregation, you should go and scatter it and say, this is my own message. No. That's not the point. Because in the word of faith only, there are a million and one messages. So the God who allowed those systems and created those tribes is not an author of confusion. But within where God planted you, there's an emphasis he has put in your spirit. And that's what determines the string of manifestation that your life commands. Are you following? But the key to accessing the voice of God is number one to pay the price of separation you must spend time in his presence the key to accessing the voice of God number two is to be sensitive and wait upon him because he speaks only to those who wait the key to accessing the voice of God number three is to be obedient when he speaks because God only talks to those who respond if he speaks to you he say cast not thy pears before the swine give not holy things to dogs not because he's insulting men but it's because of the action. He said they will trample it under foot. When God speaks, you are obedient. He keeps speaking. The key to hearing the voice of God, number four, is to believe him when he speaks. Because the reason he's speaking is so that he can be believed. Paul, John was talking in, in John chapter, 20, uh, chapter 6. Is it 16 now? The last verse of the book of John. Chapter 21 from verse 15 thereabout. When Jesus was asking Peter, Lovest thou me more than this and all of that. And when he rounded up, he said, Many things did Jesus. That were not written he said but these ones were written that you may believe that he's the son of god so when god talks to you he's talking to you because he wants you to believe but many can't hear but if you're a minister you must hear you must hear because that's what defines who you are to your generation forms are very cheap in the days of our fathers when there was no media if you pack out a stadium it's because there is power on your life and not just power but many dimensions of power Number one, there must be miracle working power. Because if you can't raise cripples, you can't attempt a stadium. In the days of the fathers, the ticket for a stadium is cripples must stand up from which year and people will see it visible. Number two, there must be enough anakazo in your world. Anakazo, the compelling power. That when men hear you, the force pulls them in the direction of God. That anakazo is what will draw the city to you. And you know, that kind of power is invested on the lives of those who stay in the presence. Because the presence of God is what descends on the hearts of men and becomes a sting in their soul. Before you do that, you must have labored over souls in love. So much love that people will know you love them. Not just talking, you would have paid the price of sacrifice and love so that people are convinced that you love them before they go out of their way to serve. You know, it was those days that pastors will go trek to look for a member who didn't come to church. And they will sit with the person and find out, why didn't you come? Is anything wrong? And they will counsel with the person and pray with the person. Those were the days when if somebody's child is sick, pastor will go there, they will pray until that child is healed. If that child is not healed, the person will look for the next place. So pastor will have to labor with that person for that healing to come. So love was liquid. But you see this media era, anybody can just create a platform and start talking anything he wants. And so we don't really know and appreciate what it takes to be a minister of God. The second reason why it's important to have this teaching, apart from the fact that this teaching will help us understand who a minister is and the responsibilities of a minister, because it's all about responsibilities. The second thing that motivated this teaching is to help us understand the honor, the benefits, and the glories that God has ascribed to ministers. In fact, it's because of the blessedness of service in the house of God that in the New Testament every believer is a minister of God there are a few that God selects to function in the fivefold but everyone who is born again is a minister of reconciliation 
and so it's important for us to let us know the role of a minister so that even those who are not in the fivefold ministry of the apostles the prophets the evangelists the pastors and teachers but who are believers saddled with the responsibility of reconciling the word to god will understand what god expects of them because if you don't know that you are a minister of god even at that level of a believer who reconciles the word to god you can afford to live carelessly and many christians are living carelessly because they don't know that the moment they got born again they became ministers of reconciliation you will not press if you don't know these things are credentials if you don't know these things are supposed to be your responsibility i read john gillette's books i know if i preach what i saw there they will slaughter me you know what john gillette said he said is desecration of the body to allow drugs to enter your body and to allow doctors to operate on you is like committing hand or two you went and read John Gillette's story and said he carried virus and he died. It takes a lot of sacrifice. If you have that orientation, you will know how to search for healing scriptures, meditate on them and drink them like Panadol. And John Gillette said he didn't stop going to eat. You see your child dying of polio, you keep praying. You see your child dying of sickness, you keep praying. Go and read these books. You will know how, why they commanded so much power. Because they told themselves, God is the only answer. Because he said when he read this Bible, he didn't see Jesus tell anybody, go and tell the doctor to help you. Because if the doctor can help you with your sickness, he can also help you about your eternal salvation. Because if the God that you are promising, that you are telling people will give them eternal security, can't give them earthly security, why should they believe eternal security? That's how the Jilly talks. If you die, you won't go to hell. Oh God, I'm in hell now. The God who will deliver me from hell on the last day, why won't he deliver me from this hell? And today, our hope is doctor. But you can't preach it now. Preach it and see what will happen. The first thing that will happen is that the sick will actually come and say, this message you are preaching, prove it. Otherwise, shut up. And because we know if we preach it, the sick will come, we advise ourselves to keep quiet. Do you know how John Gillick organized the healing technician training? When you come, you drop money. It's not interested in your money, but that money is the guarantee that you'll be there. If you are not healed in 30 days, take your money back and you can sue him. 30 days. Just sit down. He will load you with the word, load you with the anointing, load you with the presence. If you are not healed, he didn't call it uh, healing by God's providence. He called it divine healing technicians. Those are spiritual doctors. The way they have our trained doctors, God too trains doctors. He said, lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. So while the hospital is giving Panadol, giving uh, chloramphenicol, you are giving Holy Spirit. You are giving anointing. That's how John Gillick taught. And because you operated like that, everywhere he was, there was power unimaginable. It was recorded by public media, not church, that Spokane was the healthiest city in the world when John Gilly was there. He won't take no for an answer. And even him did that because he saw those before him operate like that. He said he went to one elder when he was learning about divine healing. And he said the elder told him a child fell and broke his neck. And he was in pain. And you know in their time, they didn't have all the medical facilities we have now. You know, we have too much. That's why ordinary headache begins. You, pa, 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 you take paracetamol. If there was no paracetamol, maybe it would have helped your faith better. And the man said, he's praying for the lady to be healed. And he said, ah, the neck bone is broken. No? The man said, yes, that's why he's trusting God. That's why you are trusting. I said, the bone, the spinal column, it broke. It's not a sprain. He said, yes, that's why he's praying to God. He now noticed immediately that his own belief was choking the atmosphere. So he quickly came out. He, he became like a sinner there. And he went and sat down. And that man played for six hours. And finally the man came out stretching. He said, hi, this girl was crying. Oh, can we look for a way to relieve the pain? The man said, no, she's perfectly made whole. Ah, ah, what do you mean? He prayed down the healing. And they won't stop until the girl is healed. You go in and say, Lord, show mercy on these people. And you leave. And you say, you are a minister. They bring somebody. When somebody comes to see you, you say, my daughter, the Lord just told me you are blessed. It's not Lord told anything. It's money that told you that. It's money that told you she's blessed. It's not Lord. And then they show up and say, Ha, ah, ah, ha, this person has uh, cancer. He has not been. You say, Kai, oh, Jesus. Okay, um, the Lord will help you. Um, tell the intercessors, let them put her name on the prayer altar. Let incense be going on. Even we know now, if they want to command your attention, they'll say, Somebody's here to see you and they came with seed. And you say, Okay. Mm. Ah. And my day is quite tight. All right, no challenge. I'll see the person quickly. 
But if they tell you somebody is here to see you and they came with which year, you say, ah, uh -uh. don't you know today is a busy day? Are you supposed to give me a point? Be very, I will sack you from this office. Because there is no power. See what you do. Pray for them. Let them not be healed. Be embarrassed. That embarrassment will make you go and seek God more. See, there's nothing wrong that you prayed and they were not healed. It means you are still growing. But you must take that responsibility. The Bible said in Acts 14.3, it said long time about day, speaking boldly in the Lord. And he said the Lord confirmed the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. It was not happening, they were still there. They didn't lower their head in shame. They didn't run away. They stood their ground and they kept pushing until a point came, the heavens opened. Tell yourself, manifesting God by power is my responsibility. And I will not be an average Christian. I will not be a mediocre. I will press until these things become normal and natural. You have not seen anything. I've gone for meetings. I pray for the sick. I say people are healed now. Come out. Everybody is looking at me. Come out where? The sickness is still here. I say, I know people are healed. Come out. Nobody came out. Instead of being ashamed, I say, okay, those of you who are sick, come. Almost half of the people. I, I say, so, this is my prayer. Did I pray to myself? Almost half of the people in the audience came forward. I made declaration again. Now check your bodies, you are healed. Nobody. I went and started laying hands. And then sometimes somebody was out of compassion. They went, um, I was having one pain. And they, When you leave that kind of meeting, that shame will drive you to the prayer altar. That shame will drive you to go and buy a healing book. That shame will drive you to go and check a scripture and investigate it well. And you pray and grow and come again. Why do you think they started organizing miracle service? Because they wanted to put responsibilities on themselves. Because I can come and teach you wisdom. But if I call it a miracle service, it puts responsibility on me that today there must be healing. And Jesus didn't say apostles and prophets should heal the sick. He said, everyone that believes. That means anywhere you find Christians, thank God. Oh, I will not die. Finally, I've seen my answer. But today, when people are sick, they are looking for doctors. And then when general doctors can't handle, they look for specialists. Whereas, you are supposed to be the specialist. If you come to any city where there is a church, you should thank God because there is hope for every sick person. Because if they are there, they must be healing. And if the believers can't, he said, go to the elders. He said, the elders will anoint the sick and the prayer of faith will raise the sick. Today, when you go to elders, you will see elders. <laughs> elders are supposed to be bombs in Gilead that brings cure to situations that are stubborn. But today, eldership is either based on the prophetic seed you give or your age in church. Whereas, the Bible showed us three major credentials of elders. Number one, when the sick is brought, they have faith enough to heal the sick. That's what James told us. Number two, the elders, they rule well. And they labor in word and doctrine. And then number three, the elders are those who have perfected character and they are above reproach. That's what Paul and James taught us about eldership. Today, do bazaar in church and leave money with the elders. <laughs> you will see new generation definition of elders. Meanwhile, in the days of the apostles, an elder has faith to heal the sick. He said, if any sick among you, go to the elders. They will anoint the sick. If he has seen it, to be forgiven. And the prayer of faith will raise the sick. That means the elder is the cure to sickness. And he said, the elder that rule well is worthy of double honor. Especially them that labor in word and doctrine. So the elder should rule well and should labor in word and doctrine. So if there are doctrinal issues and the generation is going in error, the elder should sit down and give us the boundary of truth. And then finally, he said, the elder should be above reproach. According to 1 Timothy chapter 3 from verse 1 to 10. But today, you know who elders are. You know. So I won't say for that. Be angry with your powerlessness. Be angry. Never get satisfied. Because you saw one death here open. It's supposed to be normal. It's supposed to be natural. I'm not saying discourage people from seeing doctors. But every time somebody comes to you and the person has to go to the doctor, weep. Because you are supposed to be the final bus stop. When they are leaving you to see the doctor, they should go to confirm their healings. Not to go there to be helped. But today I thank God that we have doctors. Because if the world depended on us for healing, 
burial services would have been the, the largest services would have been organized. Burial, requiem mass would have been the highest service. If doctors were not here, <laughs> the other time I went for a meeting and then I came back and my son was sick. They called me from Enugu that my son was sick. That he was stooling so frequently and his stomach became stiff and there was gas trapped in his stomach. I said, what kind of this thing is this? I carried my phone, made call, made declaration. When it was approaching midnight, they had to take him to the hospital. I sat down, I said, God of mercy. Apostle. <laughs> Who generation are we in? Apostle. When did I graduate? I, ask, I said, when did I graduate from brother to apostle? So, if the doctor couldn't do anything, the boy would have died. And then the next thing, I'll go and gather doctrine and scripture and come back to explain why some of these things happen. Ah! I started praying. Oh, I didn't sleep the whole of that night. Apostle. Even when I came back, I went to the hospital and said, I'm going to discharge him. When I came, they advised me. That... <laughs> they advised me that his electrolyte level is low. If you take him home now, it can affect his kidney. I looked up, looked down. I kept quiet and went and sat down. Give him some electrolyte. Now, that is my son. Do you know how many people come to us, we pray for, and they go back disappointed? How can you sleep? That was when I got angry. I collected John Gillette's book from Pastor Patrick. I collected the Elizabeth's book. I started, I said, what is this? And I was reading. When I saw the consecrations of this man, I knew we have not started. It's only when the matter goes out of hand that we now come back to God and pray religious prayer. You feel pain here. The next thing you take paracetamol. When they now tell you it's a tumor, you go to the hospital. When doctors say, Kai, there's nothing you can do, it's too large. Then you now come to the altar. Oh Lord, we know you are the answer of human crisis. You are Alpha, you are Omega. And the angels are looking at you with your drama. Do you trust God? See, a generation must rise that becomes angry at our powerlessness. See, that's why I teach the way I teach. Because it's a double-edged sword. I'm talking to you, talking to myself. All this issue of coming to pray and you are doing drama. The day problem comes, you will, you will hate yourself. You will hate yourself. They say pray, you are coming to do like this. Because you think it's dance or drama. The day death comes, if that your prayer has no power, you will hate yourself and you will hate those that made you waste your time. They say sit on the word of God, you won't. You are talking things that somebody said. Because they made you feel the message your pastor gave you is enough. The day something attacks, you will hate yourself and you will hate your religion. When people are naive, you are talking this, they think you are attacking somebody. Who has that time? Who has that time? Me, I, part of the things that inform my passion for God is the crisis and the warfare that I fight. I have seen things. The devil came for me, came for my family. I rose up out of persecution. I rose out of death. I didn't come here because I love preaching. The love of God constrained me and warfare constrained me. So what I'm doing, I'm fighting for men to live. A minister is a custodian of the power of God. Ask yourself, what aspect of your life do you have authority? And when you speak, things happen. Sit down, take it, just write it down. If somebody is poor, when I talk, the heavens open. If somebody is sick, when I talk, healing happens. Just check how many aspects of your life do you know you have authority with Jesus? If it's not there, please, I'm not saying remove your title, but go and get something that validates that title. Because I'm not the one that gave it. You must know God to a point where your life reveals the character of God. That's what makes me a minister. Praise God. And then the second part of it is that you must be able to demonstrate the power of God. God is a God of power. The first introduction of God was power and mystery. The Bible said in the beginning, God created. The word God there is almighty. That means having all might. You can't claim you are God's representative and you are as powerless and as helpless as a hopeless man. That's not the means that God raised. You must be able to demonstrate the supernatural because you are representing a supernatural God. When Moses went to Pharaoh and said, God sent me, Pharaoh didn't care about his language. Who is your God? 
I want to see him. Don't tell me what he said. And Moses knew the question. He dropped his rod. He became a serpent. And Pharaoh's people too came. Why do you think we should follow your God? We can do what your God is doing. They dropped their own rod. They became serpents. But Moses' rod swallowed their own rod. As a sign that one God is superior to others. And is so superior that none can be compared to him. Because if you try to compare yourself to him, it's at your peril. Imagine if Pharaoh's uh, wise men serpent swallowed Moses' rod. Even Moses knew that he would have run from that place. Even Moses knew. You see, why am I saying this? Our generation, we are not contending for power. We are looking for cheap Christianity. If you read about the fathers of old, you will know what it takes to be a minister. Because those days, if you come anywhere and you say you are a man of God, better prove it. Better prove it. Because if you claim that God is a healer, the whole community will gather in your house the next day with the sick. Because there were no, we don't even have hospitals to recommend people to. Jesus heals. Really? My daughter is blind. My son is deaf. And the next day, as you are opening your door, you see, good morning, prophet. And the whole community will be there with the name. Did you read the days of Jesus? In Matthew 8, 16 and 17, he said, when the evening was come, he claimed he was a healer. The Bible said they brought all that were sick to him. All. Now, doctrine ends, manifestation begins. Yes, we understand the teaching on healing. Here are the sick. Show us. And the Bible said that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Himself took away our infirmities. Because when you preach it, you must show it. And he said, Jesus touched them. And virtue left him and healed them all. And when the apostles came, they claimed that Jesus is also a healer. They said, really? Talk. No need for arguing doctrine. Because we don't know Greek and Aramaic like you do. Now, here are sick people. Help us define that verse properly. We know Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic did a good job. But the best definition of that verse of scripture is to show it. So when they went to pray, they ganged up and waited. And in Acts chapter 5 verse 15, they said they gather all the people that were sick and were waiting for them. Take time, pray, pray. You say your God answers prayer. Take your time. If you like, be there for one week. We are here waiting. And when Peter came out, lo and behold, the lame, the deaf, all of them gathered. And what happened? He said the shadow of Peter touched them. And everybody that was sick was made whole. Peter doesn't need to teach them that Jesus heals. They've seen it. That's why when Jesus was sending us out, he didn't only send us with a message. In Mark 16, 17, he said, these signs shall follow them that believe. So if the sign is not following you, it will be difficult for us to know if you are a believer. So people stand up and say, no, it's not about character. It's, uh, no, it's not all about character. Character is part of it. It's also about power. Because Jesus said, the signs that you will use to identify the believer is not character alone, it's power. That's how Jesus was identified. That's how you will be identified. In Acts 10 38, he said, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. You can't tell us God is with you and we can't see power. If God is with you, the sign is power. When Jesus descended in Luke 4 18, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Show us how. We have heard the teaching. How? The blind saw, the deaf heard, the lame walked. Even John the Baptist that preached that this is the Messiah. This is the Lamb of God that taketh away, away the sins of the world. When John was in prison, he said, wait, oh, this Lamb of God, what is happening now? And John sent to him and said, are you the one to come or do we expect another? And Jesus said, go back and tell John what you see. He didn't say, go and tell him what Isaiah said. John knows what Isaiah said. He said, go back and tell John what you see. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the dead is brought back to life. And he said, blessed is he that is not offended in me. If you don't have power, they are permitted to be offended at you. It is after you show us the credentials of power that is when they are blessed not to be offended at you. Don't come talking English and talking. To, some people are so proud about their knowledge. They attack everything, counter everything. They are even preaching the Bible as if they are the only ones who know it and everybody is wrong. No, this is Zoe. This is Soteria. This is this. Thank you for that. Your intelligent Bible study, sir. We have not seen any blind eye open. Show us where the cripples are walking. Let's see the validity of this, your message. <laughs> a minister is a carrier of power Paul said I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ it's not just a message it's the power of God unto salvation it saves the blind it saves the sinner that's what a minister is carrier and manifestor of power